Okay, well, welcome to the July meeting of the North Jersey Astronomical Group. My name is Kevin Kanan, I'm the president of the organization. And uh, I'm going to uh, introduce our speaker for tonight. We have a very special uh, speaker for tonight, uh, Dr. Mary Lou West, uh, who uh, previously had uh, taught astronomy and physics at Montclair State for, what was it, more than 35 years? 42 years. 42 years. Oh, my goodness, a lot more than 35. Uh, 42 years. And uh, also has been a member of this club for many, many years as well. And uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Mary Lou. She's going to talk a little bit about some of the research that she's been doing on the ionosphere, uh, part of the upper atmosphere of the Earth. And this is a good topic to follow up uh, the topic that we did last month, uh, where we talked uh, about uh, uh, how the sun uh, affects uh, the Earth. And you can check that out on our YouTube channel if you want to catch up on some of the uh, basics of that. Uh, and uh, so, uh, Mary Lou, if you want to take it away, uh, feel free to, to get started. OK. Um, so. I wanted to tell people if you have handy a uh, pencil and a piece of paper, just put them in front of you so you could uh, write down some things when I ask you questions, but you don't have to have that. The uh, research that I've done that resulted in, in the paper and this talk is called Ham Radio Data Show Waves in the Ionosphere. And it's run by a connection with Montclair State. So, the person in charge is um, Nathaniel Frizzell, who is now a professor at the University of Scranton in Eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, he was originally an undergraduate at Montclair State, and I was his main professor there and did research projects with him and that sort of thing. So I taught him everything he knows, kind of, sort of. And then he went off and got his PhD, did some postdocs and ended up at Scranton, uh, at which point we got reconnected and now I work for him. So I think that's really kind of cool. Uh, I'm a volunteer, um, but I, I do have uh, some privileges at the University of Scranton. At any rate, uh, we're, we're both uh, ham radio operators and almost everybody in this uh, consortium is a ham radio operator as well. And so we have a lot of fun doing all sorts of different things with, with each other. Okay, so. Uh, how do we make it advance? There we go. So um, one of the questions is uh, right off, why, why should we bother to study the ionosphere? Um, and the main, the main answer is communications. Uh, it is a source to help us do a lot of communicating with each other. Uh, cell phones, everybody have a cell phone? Um, TV satellites, so if you get streaming services, Netflix and that sort of thing, you are probably getting a signal from a TV satellite, which is up above the ionosphere. So the signal comes down through the ionosphere to your television. Uh, GPS signals come from satellites, which are way above the ionosphere. So uh, if you've ever used uh, GPS uh, software to find out where you're going, <laughs> why you should turn around and go the other way. Um, that comes through the ionosphere and that has a very, uh, very tight constraint on the timing of the GPS signals. And so uh, that, that particular constellation of satellites is really, really good at finding out minute details about everything around it, including the ionosphere. I'll tell you more about the GPS in a few minutes. Then, of course, there's military radio signals, commercial radio, if you listen to your radio, like in your car, uh, and amateur radio or ham radio operators that we talk to each other or do Morse code. Some people do Morse code um, to each other. And then one that's not communications is uh, power grid outages. So if there is a big disturbance to the ionosphere, that also can disturb. So if it's a long, any sort of long range, thousand kilometer current running through the ionosphere, That'll induce a current in anything conductive in the ground, so the rocks or pipes or power grids. And so if the ionosphere gets messed up, power grids can get messed up and can bring down whole cities or whole areas of the country, and then they need repair. So here's a diagram over here of uh, layers in the atmosphere. We started at the ground at the bottom, 
and go up through the troposphere and the stratosphere and the mesosphere, the thermosphere, and finally the outside is called the exosphere, the escaping part. And then it shows you where there's uh, balloons and airplanes and all sorts of things. But then on the right here is the part that has to do with where the ionosphere is. The ionosphere has several layers, uh, particularly the F2 layer, which is the main one here. And that's at about 250 miles above our heads. Um, the red wiggly line here uh, shows you uh, the electron density uh, and, and where the electrons are in the ionosphere, they're not evenly distributed. Okay. Here's another diagram shows the atmospheric layers, but in this diagram, we have all sorts of things that happen to various things, not just where the layers are, but what happens to them. So uh, down here on the ground, uh, we have an earthquake over here. We have a high frequency sounder, which is a kind of a, uh, like a radar. Um, there's an explosion over here. Um, uh, GNSS is GPS. Uh, receivers over here. So the satellites are up in the air, uh, or beyond the air, going around the Earth, and they communicate with these receivers on the ground. Um, so your little transponder in your car asks, where am I? And that signal goes up, uh, and it listens to whatever satellites are going across uh, over its head, and it usually gets three or four of them. And then your little... Um, computer in the GPS gizmo in your car has to then compute from where these satellites say they are to where it must solve for where it is. And one of the things, uh, the main thing that happens with each satellite is that here it listens for time signals, little pings, yeah. Now it's 10 o'clock, now it's 10.01, now it's 10.02, whatever. But they're much finer together than that, and even finer than seconds is. Uh, and it comes at two different frequencies from the satellite. And because the ionosphere is between you and the satellite, there is uh, some dispersion because of the free electrons up there. And so the signals arrive at slightly different times, even though they were sent out at exactly the same time from the satellite. Uh, and so then your gizmo uh, back calculates that and says, oh, oh, I must be about here but the electrons between me and here must be about so many. But then it listens to the next satellite and the next one. And between the bunch of them, it backs out how many electrons there are between it on the ground and the place where the satellites are. So you get a number from this gizmo on the ground to up here where the satellites are called TEC, T-E-C, that's total electron content it gives you the number of electrons altogether between you and the thing in the sky. That's total electron content. I'm just amazed at that, that it can do that. Um, but that tells us sort of uh, interesting things about the ionosphere, because it may not be exactly the same with this satellite and with that satellite. All right, then we have uh, shock and acoustic waves that come up from the Earth's surface, things like, um, the noise of hurricanes, the noise of tornadoes, the noise of earthquakes, the noise of explosions, and those travel up into the ionosphere and eventually are absorbed. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, atmospheric gravity waves, which are kind of sloshing around the Earth of large masses of, of air. Um, there's traveling ionospheric disturbances, or TIDs, and that's what my group is interested in discovering. There are waves that go around um, in, uh, in the ionosphere, not necessarily in the neutral atmosphere, which like gravity waves do. Um, there's also magnetic field lines from the Earth, of course, the Earth's like a big magnet, and uh, the magnetic field lines connect the Northern Hemisphere with the Southern mm -hmm. Hemisphere. And sometimes if you have something at ground level, which is uh, electric in some fashion, it wiggles the ends of the uh, magnetic lines at that point, and the wiggles go all the way to the conjugate point in the other hemisphere. And so that wiggles things over there. So sometimes we get a wiggle from somewhere in the South, South Atlantic. Um, the regions of the ionosphere are, are labeled by numbers E, F, and D. So the E region is lower than the F region, which is the main one up here. It's a very complicated system. And one of the 
overall questions that people in the space weather community like I am are looking for is when you have waves of some sort like these TIDs, the traveling ionospheric disturbances, what sets them up? What starts them going? Is it something on the ground that wiggles the air going up? Or is it something from the sun which wiggles the top and wiggles down? We don't, we don't know, or it could be in fact both. Okay, <clears throat> so the summary of what I'm going to tell you for a while here is that light interacts with matter. Now, as astronomers, we know this is true, right? We have telescopes and the light does things in the telescope <clears throat> that affects the way the light is focused. But there are different kinds of light. So we're gonna talk about what different kinds of light there might be. And then there are different kinds of matter as well. So we're gonna talk about what different kinds of, of matter there, there are. And then we're gonna go back and talk about the Earth's ionosphere as a type of matter. Then I told you we're really interested in these moving ripples or traveling ionospheric disturbances or TIDs that ripple along through the ionosphere, especially at the lower border where the ionosphere impinges on the neutral atmosphere where we live. And then there are different types of tools that can investigate these questions and give you data about uh, particularly the uh, bottom layer of the ionosphere and the upper layer of the neutral atmosphere. And so there's several different tools. I'm gonna to tell you about three of them uh, as we go along. So the first thing to talk about is um, that light interacts with matter. And there are only three ways in which light interacts with the matter. So you have uh, a piece of light coming along and a chunk of matter over here, and the light comes to the matter. There's only three things that can happen. So I want you to write down what are the three things that can happen and what is the best kind of matter to enhance either of these three, go. You just remember them or you could write them down if you, if you have a piece of paper. <laughs> <clears throat> So Kevin, you know the three? Don't tell me, but do you know stuff? We don't know. Okay, so. I can think of two off the top, man. Okay. Okay. Here's I what I got. Those. So Kevin, you name one of them. Uh, absorption. Absorption. So that's the middle one that I have. Right. Uh, the light goes in and gets absorbed. And the best sort of thing for that is something that's opaque and black. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so who else do we see? Mary, do you have a different one? No, I, I, wasn't, to... I wasn't sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't. <laughs> okay, well, the first one here is if you have the light coming along and there's a piece of material, one thing you can do is it never gets in, it bounces back, all right? And if it bounces back, it has to bounce off something that's, that's shiny. So the best thing to do that is a mirror. And we as astronomers have learned how to make the piece of material curved in such a way that when the light comes and bounces back, it gets all nicely uh, collimated and comes to a focus over here. So we, we know that this is a very useful thing if you wanna make a telescope, right? Does anybody know what kind of telescope it is where the light goes and bounces back? Tony. A mirror? Reflector. 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 Absolutely right. Very good. So I thought, so one thing is the light goes and it bounces back. The other is that light goes and it goes into the piece, but it never gets through and it never comes out. It gets stuck in there. And that's called absorption. And then the third one is the light goes and it gets all the way through it and comes out the backside. And that's called transmission or refraction. And a good material to do that is clear glass. So it can go right through and keep on going. Our society has also figured out how to make a piece of clear glass shaped nicely. So when the light goes through it, it comes out the other side and comes to a focus. So what kind of telescope is that one called? Refractor. A refractor, right. Very good. So, so just knowing that there's only three things that can happen allows you to learn something about two times the two time, two major types 
of, of telescopes. I don't think we can do anything with absorption that's, that's stuck. Actually, I'm, I'm wondering uh, if you don't mind me asking, um, are we talking about visual light? Are we talking all forms of electromagnetic? At the moment, just you wait. At the moment, it's just <laughs> light in general. Okay, light in general. Light in general. Okay, because so we have an instrument that does something. Mark, <laughs> there are different kinds of light. And we group these together and call it the electromagnetic spectrum. So I want you to write down or see if you could remember in your head, if you don't have a piece of paper, uh, could you name at least eight different frequency bands in the electromagnetic spectrum? Oh. Take a few moments and see if you could get eight different things. <laughs> I have six. I got seven. Oh, good. Can anybody get up to eight? <laughs> We're working on it here. This is great. This is good. I have seven. Ah, can we I count? I, 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 I may have the eighth. Did any, anybody get up to eight yet? <laughs> yes. You see, seven is not so hard, but getting a bit of farther than seven is tough. I think I got eight. I think I got eight. I got eight. We'll give a few more minutes, see if anybody else can get up to eight, eight? as well. Yeah, I think I got eight. But you know, eight is not a magic number, but seven is a magic number. Right. One, two, three, four, six. I got seven. Seven should not be hard because seven <clears throat> is a magic number. <laughs> eight is not a magic number. Eight is tougher. <clears throat> Hmm. You look into mention the different radio bands like UHF, VHF, et cetera. I just call that radio, so that's just one. Oh, oh then you want x rays. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, AM and amateurs. That's it. One. That's radio waves. Right. Can anybody say their first three, four, seven? Six, seven? Somebody who got seven. Oh, what can I'll you try. Say? Try. Well, now I have radio, which I didn't have before, but uh, visible. Audio, uh, gamma, X-ray, infrared, and ultraviolet. That's seven. Got a whole bunch of them there. Uh, has anybody my, got another set of seven? I, I yeah. got. I have radio, microwave, oh visible, God. ultraviolet, X-ray, maybe gamma. Gamma's uh, a good one. Yes. Oh, gamma's a good one. Oh, okay. Nobody knows gamma. Good for you. Oh, Great. got lucky. <laughs> Yeah. Got, lucky. got smart. Right? Got lucky. Yeah, more like luck. I have gamma. I have gamma. Well, can anybody <laughs> say what bands there are in visible? Ah, uh, I mean, uh, Roy G. Biv. Roy G. Biv. Uh, I was going to say. Oh, all right, all right Green. Wait, does anybody? Can anybody say out what Roy G. Biv means? Red, green, blue. Yeah, red, orange. Red. Orange, Orange yellow, yellow, green, blue, green, indigo, violet, violet. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Red, orange, yellow, green, green blue, blue, indigo, violet. violet. Which one is the odd color that nobody knows? Indigo. 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 So what color is indigo? Can you guess? <laughs> Dark purple. Dark, Dark blue, purple. Like blue there you go. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Why was indigo a good color <coughs> to know in the 1600s and we don't know it nowadays? The dye was, was it? valuable. Yeah. It was a royal, it was a royal color. No, it wasn't royal. That's just a royal purple. That's that's fine. Indigo is not royal purple. Oh. Indigo is just sort of dark navy blue. What did they use it for? Oh, for ink. Oh. Ink. It was the color of ink. Oh, yes. oh, yes. Oh, yes. Everybody had a pot of indigo, indigo around the house and dipped a little oh. quill pen or whatever into it. Um, just got rid of mine. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> really? <laughs> Antique? <laughs> so at any rate, those, uh, so how many, how many of those colors are there? Seven. Seven. Three, three, and there, there are seven because seven is a magic number. 
And the person who first recited this group of colors had six and they said, oh my golly, we need seven because we need a magic number and said, okay, I'll fling in indigo. Everybody knows indigo, so why not? Okay, who is that person? Mm. Who messed with color? He was the first person to take a beam of sunlight and split it into its colors. Newton? Isaac Newton, yeah, yeah. Cool famous guy. Yeah. yeah. And, but he liked magic numbers and he thought when I write out these colors, I gotta have seven of them. Oh my God, I only have six. Oh, we'll, we'll fling it in to go then. Everybody knows what that is. So, so that's what happened. And we have seven primary colors because indigo was necessary to make it seven. Okay, so then we have some others. So besides those seven people mentioned, somebody mentioned radio and somebody mentioned microwaves mm -hmm. and somebody mentioned gamma rays. That was right. very cool. But there were a couple others that I've forgotten what people said. X-ray. VHF, VHF, VHF. Space. VHF. Audio. UV. LF, audio. Uh, audio. Audio is not a color of light. No. Yeah. Audio is not part of the electromagnetic spectrum? It is ah. not. No. It's something that requires, it's not light. It requires a gas to go through. It is a sound wave. Sound wave. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. So that's something different. You, so all together, there should be 13. So we have the original seven, and then eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. And so another six of them. And we've got most of them. I think we've got almost all of them. Let's just see what we got. Um, X-ray. So if you look the third line down, yeah. radio and microwaves. <laughs> somebody did say microwaves. Mm -hmm. Infrared, mm -hmm. RGBiv, ultraviolet, <laughs> X-rays, gamma rays. Right. Very cool. So which end, and, and this line is in the order of frequency. Which end is the low frequency end? The left end or the right end? The radio or the gamma rays? Left. Radio. The radio. The radio. The radio. The radio is the low frequency end. So radio is radio is radio waves are pretty low and kind of kind of slow. Um, so then I was asked, which frequency band is your favorite? Does anybody <laughs> have a favorite? Oh, Roy G. Biv. <laughs> no, you have to pick one of them. Oh, just one. Yeah. Gamma rays. Gamma rays. Oh, there's I'll a high power no. person. <laughs> Gave Hulk his powers. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So now uh, Mary should be quiet because she knows the answer to this riddle. But my favorite riddle of the last week or so was um, what washes up on very small beaches? Hmm. It's on the it's on the page. Microwaves. Microwaves. Jeez, yes. Oh, jeez. <laughs> there you go. So now your charge was telling that to somebody else who might understand it. All right. Um, I have a question. <laughs> yeah, funny. <laughs> Mary, somebody had a question? Go. Yeah, I have a question. This is Jeff. I have a question. Um, is there anything beyond gamma rays? Very good question. And in fact, the, the real question is, how do we define these bands? Uh, who gets to choose them? And it's all dependent on what equipment you have. <laughs> so when somebody invents a new piece of equipment, then they get to name a new band. And at the moment, nobody has invented anything that is sensitive to the higher frequencies than gamma rays. So nobody has named anything above that. So gamma rays goes from here to infinity, you know? And if somebody finally finds a piece of equipment that they invent that's useful, and they wanna make a distinction between gamma rays and what would be to the right of it, then they get to name it and, and it will go on these charts. Okay. All right. And I think the people that invented um, well, I don't know. All of these came about by different pieces of technology uh, that people invented and said, look at my mine can see from here to there. I want to call it blah. I get to call it blah because I invented it. Okay, you get it. All right. Um, I guess I guess sometimes people also talk about cosmic rays. 
And they, that's kind of a misnomer because it's not really part of the spectrum, right? Because it's really high energy particles, you know? Exactly so right. Kind of confusing, yeah. Right. So somebody got a piece of equipment that seemed to be sensitive to things uh, further right than gamma rays, uh, but it turned out what they were really uh, measuring was cosmic rays, which are very fast protons. And protons are not this kind of light sort of stuff. And so finally, somebody said, go away. That's not in this group. That's in, in the next room or somewhere. Uh, and so they took, took it away. But you'll find in some books, cosmic rays do appear after gamma rays, but then they were taken away quickly. So, not bad. Does anybody have a particular favor here? Ham radio operators really like the left end, the radio end yeah, of the, the spectrum. Radio waves. Just, just wanted to say that that had to go there. OK. Let's see. So now, having determined that there are various kinds of light, at least 13 different kinds at the moment, um, number three is there are also different kinds of matter. All right, so now can you write down or remember four different types of matter and then give an example of each of one of them? You mean For, states? Yep, yep, you mean write states? something down before, let everybody have a chance. Mary Lou, you mean states? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, provinces would do as well. Oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, it took a while four. for that to sink in. I have four. I think yeah. I have four. four. Yep, there are four. Yeah, four. All right, so uh, somebody say one type and then say what a good example is. Solid. Okay, what's an example of a solid? I'd say, or no, steel, rock. Steel is good. That's a great yeah. one. Okay, so we got solid. Has somebody got another one? Liquid. Okay, what's an example of a liquid? Rain. Rain. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Did anybody have rain today? A few drops. Oh, oh. my God. <laughs> yes. I had a yes, wall of rain. So you're the one it poured on? Oh, yes. It you drove. The only one. Yep. <laughs> Oh, I had a tornado warning too. Yeah. Which, that was another funny thing. Mm. You, did you didn't get that? Did you, Mark? I saw some rotating clouds. I did not see the tornado, but you know, it, it was. Uh, I'm glad I didn't get to see the tornado. Let's put it. Like I'm that. glad you did not get to see the tornado. Right. So that's two. So we have solid and liquid. Anybody got another one? How about a gas? How about a gas? What's an example of that? Air. Air. Perfectly good. Those are the three they teach you in middle school. Now there's a fourth one. What's that? I got it. Plasma. 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 Yeah. Great. Okay. What's an example of a plasma? Superheated argon gas in a mass spectrometer. Turns it into a are we specific? Specific. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Has anybody got another plasma? About the sun. The sun, yeah. Sun. Yep. Very good. Very good. Okay. Or, how about blood? No, that's a different kind of plasma, but indeed they use the same word. That was a joke. <laughs> so here's what I wrote down. Beer. Ooh. <laughs> beer. I like that. Better than rain. <laughs> and the gas is the bubbles in the beer when you first pour it. Uh -huh. And a plasma is also a flame, a candle flame or a match flame or anything like that. And of course, the one I really want to talk about is the ionosphere, not flames. But anyway, uh, number four is Earth's ionosphere, which is an example of a plasma. Uh, plasma means it's electrically charged in some way. So this is a gas with some electrically charged particles in it. Uh, it's not very electrically charged. Only one to 10% of the uh, particles are electrically charged. It's mostly neutral. Well, what does that come out to mean? So in the second point, it's neutral nitrogen molecules, so N plus N, uh, neutral oxygen molecules, so O plus O. There are some ions which are positively charged and some electrons which are negatively charged. And they're equal numbers because overall it's always neutral. Um, so that, that's what it is. And it's caused by the ultraviolet light coming from the sun. So the sun puts out ultraviolet light, comes to the earth, goes down through the a little bit of the atmosphere, comes to the ionosphere and goes, wow, and gets absorbed, 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 
and the absorption process results in some electrons being torn off of their molecule and becoming those becoming ions. All right. So by the time the light from the sun, the whole bunch of light from the sun gets through the ionosphere, the ultraviolet has all been lost because it's been taken up by cutting these neutral molecules apart. Um, and so this is very good for us, especially those of us who have pale skin, because by the time the light gets to the ground, there's not very much ultraviolet there at all. And so we can't get burned, sunburned right away. Yay. Okay, so the ultraviolet light from the sun causes the ionosphere to become electrically charged. And once the electrons are torn off from their molecules, they just sort of wander around for a while. So since it's daylight, which does this, the ionosphere is thicker and more intense during the daytime. And as the nighttime goes on, it gets less and less charged as the electrons eventually find uh, their ions and recombine with them. So this occurs from 100 to 300 kilometers above our heads uh, and uh, the air below it is neutral and mostly whatever is above it is also neutral. So here's a uh, diagram, which I think is interesting. <clears throat> the X axis across the bottom is temperature in degrees Kelvin. And so as you go to the right, the gas is getting hotter and hotter. All right. So the Y axis, which goes up toward the top is the altitude above the earth. And this one's in kilometers. And we look at the wobbly Tracy line there. There's a different one for summer and winter, but not very much. Uh, which means that as you go up from the Earth's surface, um, the temperature gets a little colder, gets a little hotter, gets a little colder, and then wow, gets way hotter. <clears throat> so you see that line that begins at 100 kilometers goes swooping off to the right? That's telling us that the ultraviolet light from the sun got absorbed there, and it not only made the ions come apart a little bit, the you know, atoms come apart a little bit, but also gave them some thermal energy and they're bombing around at great speed. So that, that really, I think is a very exciting graph. <clears throat> so as the temperature goes up from around 200 Kelvin, which is where we are uh, nowadays here at the, at the Earth's surface, uh, goes up to a thousand Kelvins. That's pretty, pretty amazing. Mm. Okay, so now part, point number five. <clears throat> we have this slightly ionized layer, the plasma above a neutral layer. And there are moving ripples in that. These moving ripples are at the bottom where these two layers of gas come together. Uh, and they are vertical excursions, vertical variations in the lower edge of the ionosphere. Or they can be thought of as vertical variations in ionization or percent of electrons, something like that. Uh, these ripples, and there's a diagram here, some measurements of some ripples. Um, these ripples travel pretty fast. They go about 1200 kilometers an hour, uh, which is faster than my car goes, right? <laughs> so then it's considered fast, okay. There are two kinds, uh, we have divided them into medium scale waves and large scale waves, fairly arbitrarily, but different uh, pieces of equipment, um, can detect the medium scale ones better or the large scale ones better. And the type of equipment that we have is better at the large scale ones. So we find this a useful sort of a division to make. So the large scale ripples, the large scale disturbances have wavelengths greater than a thousand kilometers. So these are very large fat waves uh, but they travel fast, so they're large fat waves, and they zoom along, and they have a period, which means if you stand still on the ground and look up at one, goes from a lot of it to little of it to a lot of it again, in a half, anywhere from half an hour to three hours. So the ones that we mainly find are the ones in the two-hour category. Um, but there are, there are waves up there, they're traveling above our heads, and... Um, they're fairly large scale compared to us. Anybody got any questions so far? Okay, moving along. So now <clears throat> there are different types of tools that you can use to investigate these various things. And so 
there's three types of tools for investigating the traveling disturbances. Uh, the first one is professional backscatter radars. Uh, the super darn collaboration is the biggest one. Uh, so it's super, D-A-R-N is an acronym, dual auroral radar network. So there are pairs of radars that look from wherever they are northward toward the poles. They look northward toward uh, toward Alaska, toward uh, Canada. They look toward the aurora and try to measure things about what makes the aurora tick. Um, there are a group of them around the pole. There's a group of them at high latitudes. There's another group at mid latitudes. And um, the closest one to us is in Virginia, at Blacksburg, Virginia, at Virginia Tech. Um, the second type of tool for measuring these ripples is deductions made from analysis of the GPS signals. And that's where you can, uh, if you have a stationary place on the ground that is listening to several of the satellites at one time, it can back out the number of electrons between it and space. And that's called the total electron content or TEC. Quite different, and yet they give the same sort of answers. But they are distributed differently on the world, so that's an interesting part. And now we have the third tool, and that's the ones, the one that uh, Nathaniel and our group is working on. This is a deduction. It's deduced from the crowdsourced ham radio communications data. There are three networks which are set up by uh, individual amateurs. So does this citizen science. Uh, one's called the Reverse Beacon Network, or RBN. The other one is the Weak Signal Propagation Reporter Network, or WhisperNet. I love that, WhisperNet. Uh, and the PSK Reporter. Uh, but each of these gizmos does is it's, it has an antenna somewhere, or several antennas somewhere, uh, that just uh, listen to the radio waves wafting through the air around them. And what it records is if there's a conversation, if there is a connection between ham radio person here and ham radio person over here, and what it records is the frequency that they're using, uh, 14 megahertz or 20 meters, turns out to be a very useful one. But anyway, what frequency they're on, what time they began, what time they stop, where the two people are. It does not record anything about the conversation, but only that there is a conversation and that's called a spot. All right. Um, each of these looks uh, in a slightly different way at what's out there. The whisper net uh, particularly looks for very soft, quiet signals, uh, very low power and uh, uses some really fancy um, computer software to tease out these conversations from uh, the background. At any rate, so all three of them. They are put up on, on websites in near real time. Uh, so within a minute, it's up there, just that there was a conversation between here and there. Um, the reason for them is to help out other ham radio operators. So, uh, the idea was that uh, after dinner, you would go to your study and turn on your ham radio and think, well, who can I talk to tonight? Well, the ionosphere is very finicky sometimes for ham radio communications. And uh, you want to try to turn your antenna or turn your uh, attention to wherever there's likely to be somebody who's going to be talking. Uh, so you can turn on one of these networks, look at its website, and it'll say, a lot of people from New Jersey are now communicating with people in Ohio, and nobody's communicating with anybody in Texas. Okay, I'm in for Ohio. Off I go. <laughs> turn the antenna that way and see if I could rouse somebody to talk to me. Or nobody is talking to anybody in the United States very well, but there's a big opening to England. Everybody's talking to somebody in England. Find somebody in England then. Okay, I'll do that. So that was the usefulness of it. Uh, and, but there are huge numbers of ham radio operators in the world and they talk to people all the time. And it turns out the number of spots or 
communications, individual communications, is well over uh, 200 million a day now. So this is big data. So I thought I'd show you a picture of some uh, ham radio folks there. Uh, ham radio hobbyists communicate over thousands of kilometers away. And that's well beyond the horizon of the Earth, which is, of course, a spherical ball, not a flat Earth. Um, and the radio waves from my radio go up, hit the ionosphere, come back down, bounce off the ground, go up again, and can bounce three or four times around the Earth to get to somebody in England or somewhere far away, and I could actually talk to them. Uh, there are multiple, multiple hops. But if the ionosphere bottom is wiggling or moving in any way, uh, these signals can be sent sideways or they can fade away or they could be intensified because sometimes when you have uh, like a, a dish-shaped concave part of the ionosphere, your signal goes up and gets concentrated down to somebody on the ground over there. It's like focusing a telescope. Um, so the signals come and go. They fade and intensify uh, sometimes on periods of minutes. And uh, this would indicate finally a range in which you could communicate, which is suddenly very larger or suddenly very smaller than what you had a few minutes ago. And range is what we're going to measure. So our new tool involves understanding ionospheric variability. Uh, this is a frontier topic in the space physics community. None of us really know what's really going on. But these can reveal changes in the ionosphere itself. And these communication statistics or spots are logged by this automatic equipment, uh, somebody's computer in their basement, right? and then put on the website uh, within a few seconds. Uh, so these statistics began to be kept a decade ago. Uh, they do several different frequencies between 3 and 30 megahertz, so the uh, high bands. Um, so there's the three things, the RBN, PSK Reporter, and WhisperNet. And they reach millions and millions of spots every day. Oh, missed one. Try again. Oh. Back, back, back. Millions of spots, okay. Mm -hmm. So the older instruments, I want to show you a little about them. Uh, one, there's the super darn radars, which do not look like a dish, like you <laughs> think of as a usual type of uh, they're just uh, a series of vertical poles, and it's uh, phase-coded. Uh, phase um, the two diagrams with green, blue, and orange on them are maps of the North Pole and the South Pole, uh, show you where these various things are and what their fields of view are. So there's the polar group in green, the high latitude in blue, and the uh, mid-latitudes in orange. So they're several dozen of these in the Northern Hemisphere and a dozen or so in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, I really liked the diagram on the left there. It's very colorful. Uh, it, I find it symmetric and beautiful. So I made it into a quilted pillow, uh, which is in the picture in the upper right. Um, and, and that's Nathaniel on the day he got his PhD, the PhD. This is defense, and that's me, and I gave him the pillow. <laughs> Nobody will understand this. At any rate, the second older instrument is the TEC, total electron content, deduced from the GPS array. And that produces um, maps like you see on the right side. Uh, these are both on the same day, but at different times of day. So one is at 1343 universal time. The bottom one is 1613 universal time, so three hours later. And what is shown in the picture, the color code is the blue is not very many electrons and the orangey red is lots of electrons. And what you can see there is that they are you know, on that day aligned in stripes, which are nearly horizontal, but not quite. And they travel from the upper left down to the lower right. So these waves, which stretch all the way across the United States are coming downwards uh, from Canada toward Florida. So uh, ionosphere variability <clears throat> is a very, very complex system. And this makes it frustrating, but also very, very exciting. 
it's driven from below by atmospheric forcing, um, but it's also driven from above by space weather forcing. Uh, so it's impacted from forces from both the top and the bottom. From the bottom, it's driven by tornadoes. Hey, Mark. <laughs> Earthquakes, tsunamis, atmospheric gravity waves, which are long range waves that go around the earth. Um, they're also driven from the top by solar flares, coronal mass ejections from the sun, and the aurora that they produce in the auroral oval. So here's a picture of a coronal mass ejection being blasted off from the surface of the sun. As I said, there are several different scales. There's large and medium uh, size. Um, and the large scale waves have appeared from half hour to three hours and wavelengths greater than a thousand kilometers. That's the ones we're interested in at the moment. Got a question, Mary Lou? Yes. Um, can they be affected by uh, pollution like CFCs? That's a very good question and we don't know. I remember, you know, there was a lot of talk about, you know, when they banned CFCs, you know, in refrigeration because it was disturbing the, the ionosphere, right? Right. And allowing uh, ultraviolet to penetrate. So that is, this is one of the questions we're hoping to answer one day. <laughs> Further off questions. Um, what that does is it sets the whole ionosphere deeper into the atmosphere or now that they're gone away, allows it to go up further. Um, and we're not sure what, if we can even measure that and, and uh, can we deduce from that is pollution abatement working? Um, I don't know. Okay. But yeah, I must do something. <laughs> so I have three pictures here uh, and this is under the uh, part which is called validation, uh, which uh, we are doing again right now. Um, so the top picture is the new tool, uh, range distance versus time of day for ham radio data. So each of those little tiny yellow dots is an individual conversation. And there are, I don't know, a million dots on the picture, whatever. And what you see is um, at the bottom of the yellow part where it impinges on the dark blue, there is a kind of a waviness. And we've taken um, a red pen and written little red dots. Can you see the side curve there at the mm -hmm. lower left? Uh, that's a sinusoidal wave. <clears throat> so it is kind of a sine wave, but then it dwindles out and doesn't continue. Uh, but this would be from uh, like 1300 hours to uh, maybe mm, 1900 hours, something like that during that day. So that's the ham radio stuff. It matches on that day, the super darn radar from, I think this is the one in Blackstone, Virginia, mm -hmm. um, in which the machinery is sending out a radar wave and then getting it back again. Uh, it's not passive, it's sending something out. And again, at the lower left, you see the sine curve and it matches uh, the radio data above it. And then at the bottom, we have the total electron content data from the GPS satellites. And here again, we have a, a kind of wiggly wave, but you notice that they're in uh, opposite phase to the ones above them. So mm -hmm. these two come together, then they go apart, and they come together, then they go apart, and they come together and go to part. So we think it matches up. So the question is, if you have a new tool, why is the new tool at all useful? Uh, does it just do what the other ones did or does it do something better or, or more? It does do something better and more. So in particular, it's got very high resolution spatially because there are a million air radio people with stuff in their basement, right? <clears throat> so it is not undersampled in North America or Europe. It is undersampled in Siberia, in China, and lower India, and Antarctica. But if you look at the map to the right, you see um, a map of the world and the little yellow dots are some particular day uh, where there were conversations and the number there is 242,607,806 conversations at the end of that day. That was pretty neat. I love the, the bigness of the numbers. All right, so the important thing that we're uh, interested in is the midpoint between the two people who are conversing 
And the midpoint is where there's the bounce on the ionosphere. So that's where the ionosphere comes into it. And the midpoints cover the oceans. If you look between North America and Europe, there's a whole bunch of midpoints in the middle of the ocean. We can find things about the ionosphere there that the radars cannot because they do not look over the oceans. Uh, also in the equatorial regions, there are no radars in the equatorial regions and yet there are ham people there. So that's useful. Um, and they can operate in the summertime mm -hmm. when the professional radars have very weak ground scatter because the ground is dry and doesn't reflect radar waves very well. So we have two histograms here, the green one at the top, uh, which is the two lumps, the left and right lump, are super darn um, detections of TIDs uh, during one year. And they are in the fall, but not, uh, so they're in, in the spring rather, January, February, or March, not in the summertime, but again in the fall. And in the bottom, the gold and green histogram uh, shows the number of detections by ham radio operators of quiet days. So when there are no TIDs, just quiet, but they got something and that continues really well into the summertime. So that's when it's gonna be useful. So I want to tell you a little bit also about another thing that the group is doing, and that is we're, we've designed and are building personal space weather stations. So people often have in their backyard a weather station, uh, which has a rain gauge and a, a wind indicator and a, all sorts of things. This is going to be for space weather, though. So it'll have a ground magnetometer, uh, software-defined radi radio, um, other, uh, other things to detect things of a more uh, electrical nature. And soon we will have a, a DAISY, which is a distributed array of small instruments. I love it. Um, so the ham side PSWS will come in two sizes. The tangerine is the big size and the grape is the little size. And the tangerine will cost like $500 and the grape will cost like only $100. And you're gonna be able to buy these and put them in your backyard. Mm -hmm. And these also then, will send data to an amalgamated source. And these will be used to study solar flare impacts, uh, geomagnetic ionospheric storms, uh, internal ionospheric electrodynamics, so that's the waves, um, short time scale and small spatial scale variability, uh, and connections that they have to the lower atmosphere. Um, so we have 30 grapes out there now. Um, because of the shortage of chips, we cannot make any more of them, but we have a whole bunch evidently lined up reading for their chip and that will happen soon. So under future work, uh, the first picture there on the top is uh, Diego Sanchez. He's my research student, he's at NJIT um, and he's doing climatology, which means uh, classify them in every which way you can. And it was his gold and green graph you saw previously. And one of the things he's found is the TIDs are fewer in the summer, even though they can see the ionosphere, they're not detected. So we're interested in that one. Below that, we have um, Bill Engelke at the University of Alabama. He's a faculty member and he's into machine learning. He uses a program called TensorFlow, uh, which takes pictures like the picture on the right, which is a graph, uh, and then looks for items within the picture that he has defined to be small sine waves. And in this picture, it's found several of them, which are where the little boxes are, are located. And that's gonna do it automatically. So things we're going to look into is uh, the solar cycle. We have more than a decade of data now from the ham networks. Um, we're gonna look at climate change in that uh, things should be not only changing in a, in a sinusoidal matter of some sort, but also trending upwards or downwards in some way, long-term trends. And so here's a diagram of the most recent 400 years of sunspot <laughs> observations. And that red spot on the left there is the, the Maunder minimum when there were very few sunspots, uh, very few auroras, very few all sorts of things. And uh, we're wondering if that'll ever happen again. Nobody knows. Uh, we're going to be doing simulations, which are uh, first principle. You take some physics, you code it into the computer, and you run all sorts of case studies and see what happens. 
Uh, and we also have a couple students working on the ray tracing. Uh, what we have here in this diagram is that the ground is at the bottom of the slightly curved arc. Uh, the yellow layer up in the sky there is the ionosphere part of it. And uh, somebody at the left at zero there is sending out radio waves and they go up and some of them scoot off into the ionosphere and keep on going. They're lost to space. Those are the little white marks going up uh, up there. Uh, but uh, some of their um, waves are bounced from the ionosphere's lower level back down to the ground and bounced up again. And uh, you could see what people you might be able to talk to there. So the ray tracing, um, there are several ray tracing routines, but they are all private. Um, well, they've been described, but the coding is a little bit tricky and the coding is not public. So what we're doing is writing a public uh, open source version of ray tracing and it will be available to everybody. So uh, in space physics, they have, a, I think, a very funny thing about ray tracing programs. So everybody has a ray tracing program, but it's always private. It's like a toothbrush and you don't use anybody else's and they can't use yours. <laughs> <laughs> no I don't know. So we're making a, a public one and everybody could use it and it'll be fine. That'll be just fine. But it's trickier than we thought. So, so this new tool, this amalgamated ham radio spot data, should help us to learn a lot more about the Earth's ionosphere. And that's what we're up to. So one thing I'd like to tell you also quickly here is um, some of you know about the Ophiuca sculpture. Oh, don't I helped design this thing. So the picture on the right is what it looks like. It's a big mess of aluminum up on a steel rusty tripod over a concrete disc. All right, but this is art. It was designed by Mac Adams and me in 1988. And the shadow that the sun casts of this mass of aluminum on the disc comes together on July 17th at 1 p.m. in the afternoon. It's next Sunday. I think we should go. I'm going to go up to Montclair State and look at it. It's front of the cells building, very close to where we have our observing patio. So here's, uh, here's the shadow, what it looks like. Um, and uh, Mark Zdarsky and I went up there in May. So it happens every year, May 24th and July 17th at 1 p.m., which is local noon, of course. Um, and to a few days on either side of, of both of those dates. So the story is about Mr. Ophiuchus, a man in Babylonian times who struggled with the snake of all knowledge and got it by the throat and made it give him knowledge. And so there's what the shadow looks like. That's a picture of me looking at it there. Um, and he chose knowledge of medicine so the symbol for doctors or EMTs is a staff with a snake wrapped around it. It is this snake. So there you go. Come see the shadow with us next sun Sunday if it's clear. Thanks for your attention. Do you have any more questions? Uh, yeah, Ed had a question in the, in the chat. And uh, he asked about uh, whether or not in your research did you have to get a ham radio operator's license. Yeah, yeah, I have a ham, ham license. Did you have to learn Morse code? No. <laughs> yeah. If you're older and got it earlier, you had to learn the That's right. Morse yes, code. you did. <laughs> you did not have to learn Morse code. Yay! Hey. I hate Morse code. <laughs> did not have to learn it. I learned it partly and, and never really got past R, so I don't know it. So. Uh, Ed, Ed also asked uh, whether or not you have a, fav a favorite QSL postcard. I haven't got any of them. Um, <laughs> so I don't, I don't talk on the radio very much. In fact, my radio is now broken, so oh. I, can't, I can't do it anymore. But uh, uh, I don't know if you remember when we had it at Montclair State um, for a while in the astronomy storage room, I had a big... Uh, whole bunch of, of QSL cards um, oh, cool. hanging, hanging on the wall. I don't uh, think it's there anymore. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. Uh, that, that was very cool. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I, I had one, uh, not really a question, but more, more of an observation. So that, uh, that graph of the temperature. Right. And where it starts to rise and and, uh, and, and goes far to the left, excuse me, to the right, it happens at around 100 kilometers. That's that theoretical Kármán line where the uh, uh, space, you know, outer space begins. So uh, could that is that a factor or? Uh... I believe it's all related. I'm not exactly sure quite right how, but it, but it has to do very much with the density of the gas as you go up. Right. Uh, of course, as you the dense, the gas is pretty dense down here, and as you go up, it gets less dense, less dense, then quite a bit less dense, and so the edge of space is where the density reaches a certain level, right. uh, by definition, and um, it's at that sort of level where uh, the ultraviolet from the sun is having a big effect. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, I think it's all related. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I believe those measurements were taken by thermometers on balloons, <laughs> oh. weather balloon. <laughs> Up it goes. I don't think you want to go up there and try to breathe. No. <laughs> not, not a good idea. Not a good idea. Mary Lou, I, I just had another quick question. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, during your presentation, you mentioned about um, the signal hops, and I'm really taxing my memory here. I haven't messed with, talked or, to anybody about ham in a million years, but um, are they the same as skips? Because, you know, we're talking about the QSL postcards. Yeah, okay. yeah. I think oh, okay. Are Hobson thing. skips the same? Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I suppose it matters. Do you use two feet or one foot? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it just amazes Here's me that you could actually have a little radio and a little antenna and, you know, a hundred watt light bulb sort of thing. And you could send a signal out and talk to somebody who is way around the curvature of the earth. That's right, you know, Australia. Somebody yes. in England or in Germany or somewhere like <laughs> that. Right. It's going ba -doop, ba -doop, ba -doop, ba -doop, ba -doop, all yep. the way to them. That's just amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Hmm. What fun. <laughs> Mary Lou, are you and Nathaniel going to try to do the uh, experiment again during the next eclipse? Yes. Uh, in fact, we're going to do it in the eclipse in 2023, as well as the one in 2024. Mm. Uh, the one in 2023 is only annular, mm -hmm. but we're going to try to go out somewhere. I'm not sure where yet. Uh, set up a clip, uh, yeah. ham radio stuff. And, and, and uh, we're also going to organize, as we did the first time, the one in 2017, uh, a QSO party, which is a contest. And if you take part in the contest you get points oh cool. people will do all sorts of things for points <laughs> it's a wonderful thing <laughs> and um and therefore generate lots and lots of <clears throat> thoughts and see if we can analyze them and of course the the interesting thing is as the eclipse path comes across a certain area of the world not only is the surface made darker and cooler but the ionosphere is also made darker and cooler, even yeah. for a short time, just for an hour. Uh, it changes the reflectivity of the um, of the ionosphere itself. Okay. And can we measure it? Can we measure it accurately? Not yet, but we're working on that part of it. Um, but it's like if you had a, a, a telescope, which was a, a, a mirror, a reflector, and you blew a cloud across it. Uh, it would change what you saw for a while. And once the cloud goes by, then it should be back to normal again. How soon is back to normal? <clears throat> and um, so this is, uh, this is one of the things that interests me is that if you cool down the atmosphere, the ionosphere, so some of the electrons find their partners again, it's like nighttime. Um, how long does it take them to find their partners? It doesn't happen instantly. Is it 20 minutes? <clears throat> is it a whole hour? Is it an hour and a half? How long does that take? This is chemistry, right? And how these little particles move and find each other in an atmosphere in which they have to bounce past other things to find each other. So it's both physics and chemistry. I think it's an interesting thing. Very cool. Yeah. 
<laughs> any rate, yeah. I don't know where we're going to go in 2024, possibly Texas. I don't know. Even though my son lives in Vermont in the path of totality, where it's always cloudy in <laughs> April. <laughs> Forget that. And in, uh, in 2023, Mary Lou, where, where are you headed then? Uh, we haven't decided yet. In fact, we have um, two grant applications <clears throat> in one for each of these eclipses uh, to buy some equipment to take with us. And, uh, <clears throat> that was left that was left mm, blank or unanswered in the uh, grant proposals. Mm -hmm. um, so we really don't know. But we yeah. do know what equipment we want. <laughs> <laughs> Step one. <laughs> Step one, let's get some more equipment. What you always need is more equipment. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, then we'll, we'll move on. Uh, do you want to look at some of the um, the new web uh, space telescope images? Sure. I mean, I we, got, we got them. That'd be great. A lot of people have seen quite a few of them, but uh, yeah. you know, just in case you haven't, I suppose. You know, uh, so this is the uh, uh, deep field, the, the web uh, deep field, the, the web's version of the deep field that uh, the Hubble Space Telescope originally did, uh, I don't know, what, three of them, something, at least at least two or three of them. Uh, and uh, the amazing thing is that, you know, the Hubble took many days, somewhere between anywhere between 13 and 20 days to build up the... Uh, uh, deep fields that they published, uh, this is, you know, only hours, you know, so this telescope is big enough that it can do what Hubble did in days can do it, it can do in hours, you know, so it's kind of amazing. Uh, and you can see lots of stuff going on here. You've got some, uh, quite a few foreground stars uh, in this image, but everything else you see is, is galaxies, you know, so you just, masses of galaxies and you've got uh, gravitational lensing going on here you can see distorted pictures of distant galaxies and so it's really quite a quite a busy and amazing uh, image here yeah. beautiful yeah love the diffraction yeah. spikes too yeah yeah you know i saw a couple of comments online like uh, oh geez why couldn't nasa turn off the star filter you know like, <laughs> star <laughs> filter. <laughs> not a tiktok filter you know it's actual diffraction grading uh diffraction uh spikes from uh the actual structure of the telescope you know the uh mm -hmm. supports for the secondary mirror uh are causing those uh those spikes you know and uh, i suppose they could have digitally remove them but uh, it makes it nice you can distinguish which objects are stars and which are galaxies pretty easy easily by just looking at the diffraction spikes you know is it, is it, is it due to the hexagonal shape of the elements um you know i forget how many it's mostly to do with the struts uh that hold up the strut the, the secondary mirror and i forget okay. how many struts there mm -hmm. are you know uh, but that's okay. what's causing the, the pattern. And, and is this also the deep time uh, exposure or photograph? Yeah, yeah, deep. That's the the, the deep field is what they yeah. call those. Yeah. And uh, hey, Kevin, you think they, they plan to uh, replicate what uh, the Hubble deep field and make a comparison of the two? I don't know, but it's a good idea, you know, because we're, like I said, there's, there's two or three of them. And they could, uh, you know, replicate those pretty easily, pretty quickly. You know, some of them are already posted on the I/O group. That yeah. they've already made the comparison. Well, he, I think he means no, reshoot yeah. them. I think is what what he means. You know? Oh, okay, right, right, right. Which you could do. It would be a nice comparison. Uh, yeah. So. Um, uh, <clears throat> so there's. Um, uh, the, yeah, this is uh, uh, Stefan's Quintet. It was a pretty popular uh, target object for amateur astronomers. And uh, so this is pretty spectacular. If you look at the uh, galaxy on the left, uh, you can actually distinguish individual stars in this, in this galaxy, which is pretty amazing, you know? Mm. Must be close by. 
Um, I forget what the distance oh, sir. Yeah. Stefan's Pintet is. It's not close. Well, it's not close by. Uh, comparatively close. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's, yeah, it's not billions. So Everything like, is relative. You know. yeah. Kevin, which, which is the fifth galaxy? Like, you can definitely make out four galaxies, and I know there's a fifth one. Is Oh, oh those two. I think it's this, too. Wow. You know, the, 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 okay. the colliding. They talked about the merging, yeah. Colliding okay. pair, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, I didn't even... I think, I think the one on the left is much closer than the other ones. So that's why you can resolve it, right yeah. but not in the other ones. You know, so that's more of a foreground object. It's not gravitationally bound. I don't think it's too far apart. So I see a lot of uh, rightward pointing V's that look like um, a whole bunch of spacecraft or something going to the right. You know what those are? So uh, let's see. Um, but at any rate, what's the next one? Oh, there's a good one. Yeah, this is the, the Southern the ring. ring. You know, the Southern Ring, you know, of course, uh, this time of year, we, uh, we love looking at the Ring Nebula in Lyra. But this is uh, the Southern Ring, uh, which we can't see from New Jersey. And so uh, I'm not quite sure what this uh, looks like in amateur telescopes. I'm not sure. But uh, uh, this is really a spectacular image. So beautiful planetary nebula. And you can really see the structure of it. You can really see that the uh, star, as it was dying, it's you know shoving off these shells of gas out into space. And you can actually see the the shells uh, in in this in this image, which is really kind of amazing. And you can see the center part of the nebula is uh, all lit up. Uh, speaking yep. of ultraviolet light, you've got this white dwarf down in here mm -hmm. pouring out ultraviolet light, and that's illuminating uh, all these gases you know, towards the center of the nebula. So you get this bubble of ionized gases in the middle of it. So quite a spectacular image. I think this is my favorite of the ones that have been released so far. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. You know, it looks like a great white shark with its mouth open. <laughs> I just realized that. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. It does. It does. <laughs> I, like, I like the fact that they said that in the left side, sort of like around ten o'clock, was a a galaxy, an edge on galaxy. Oh, yeah. see it there. Yeah. Like a um a sombrero. Yeah. Lookalike type thing. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> That's pretty cool. Yeah, pretty neat. Hey, there are, there are a few galaxies in this picture. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess, well, certainly this one. Uh, maybe and there's a few here. down in the bottom here, too. Yeah, down They're there. all over the place. I keep looking, yeah. and they're popping out. More over here and over there. So, yeah, pretty pretty neat image. And this is the part of, this is a, a tiny part of the Carina Nebula. Uh, this is, uh, I think Hubble took a similar image, and they refer to it as the Cosmic Cliffs. There's mm. this cliff of, of gases. And uh, off above the edge of the top of the photo, you know, there's young stars. And again, there's ultraviolet light pouring out of these stars. And you get this kind of bluish glowing gas. And you can see this dense gas down below. And this is where stars are forming. So it's a tremendous star forming region in the Southern Hemisphere. So it's really quite, quite amazing. And this is just a tiny piece of... Um, Pretty big nebula, you know. So it'd be interesting if to see if they can do a mosaic of this and make it larger. That would be really kind of spectacular. And I forget, I can't remember which image I was looking at, but one of the images in this set, um, the original, the, the the original copy, is uh, fifteen thousand pixels across and twelve thousand pixels high. Oh. <laughs> big camera. Um, yeah, so it's that's that's a lot of pixels. <laughs> I <rest. laughs> So, and uh, the fifth image is actually not really an image image at all, but a, a spectrum. And so this is that uh, giant exoplanet. So this is a gas giant planet, uh, WASP ninety six. And uh, you can see some real nice uh, spectrum here with some nice indications of water vapor uh, mm -hmm. in the atmosphere. And so this is really exciting. We've only, uh, I think there are only two or three other exoplanets 
uh, that we've been able to detect water vapor in the atmosphere. And uh, Webb Space Telescope being much larger uh, can detect this really quite easily. And so I'm sure that number will go way, way up as the Webb does more and more observations. And so, um, so this is really exciting. You know, if you want to find another Earth-like planet out there, you need an instrument like this to, to help you find it. You know, look for uh, signs of life in the atmosphere and different chemicals and that sort of thing. So really interesting stuff. Okay, well, that's the uh, uh, end of our uh, images here. For sharing this, Kevin, this is great. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, so we're going to wrap up this part of our uh, of our meeting. Um, uh, Mary Lou, are, are we doing our summer uh, our roundup, or what do we want to talk about it for the September meeting? Oh, oh yes. So it's there's summer. no meeting. There's right. no meeting in August. You skip August. Skip August, but <laughs> September, um, we're going to do. Um, Members Astronomy Adventures or something like that. Right. Right. Uh, where, uh, whatever you've done over the summer or, mm -hmm. or in fact around the whole year, what sort of uh, things you've done that's been astronomical and, and interesting. Mm -hmm. 